Hello. Um, can everyone hear me? Awesome. Um, let me just check to make sure we're recording. Um, okay. Um, welcome. Um, I just would like to check in with you guys. Um, also, if you could put your um, IDs, uh, the three letters and like series of numbers um, in the chat, that would be great just so that I could take attendance. Thank you. Sorry, I was running a little late today. Um, Okie doke. So basically, we are talking midterm one. Um, I don't really have much planned for midterm review sessions because I heavily just rely on what you guys think that you need to work on. Um, so I guess the question is, what do you guys think you need to work on? Um, any trouble that you had? Um, are there any questions you would like to try? Okay. Um, let's do some of those then. Do you have an example problem? Um, and we can definitely do some derivatives of trig functions. I'm actually going to pop open the book instead of the sample exams I was looking at, if you give me just one second. Um, Okie doke. Um, okay, doke. Sounds good. Um, let's find some let's find some stuff then. Um, Are you going to be here for like a little bit now um, because I can track down a couple of absolute value limit practice problems. Let's start for now. Or we can just do derivatives of trig functions for a little bit. Um, that is going to be in chapter two, so I'm going to track that down. Um, I'm assuming you guys haven't taken the exam yet. Um, when is it due? Is it due today? Monday. Gotcha. Okay. Where is the section that I'm looking for? It is 2.3, right? Let's try a couple derivatives of trick functions. Um, trig functions. Um, so this is going to be in 2.4 and we can go ahead and start with problem. Let's maybe try problem 11, which is f of theta is equal to sine theta over 1 plus cos theta. 
So part of working with trig functions is starting to think about how can we solve this type of problems. Um, when you look at this and when it says to differentiate, what is the first thing that you think of doing? Actually, let's not do, let's do a very similar looking problem, but not quite the same. Um, let's do problem 13. This is y of t is equal to t sine 14. Wrong problem. y of t is equal to sine t over 1 plus tan t. It's a lot of... So same type of problem, but we swapped out one of the, uh, the trig identities um, just for practice, practice's sake. Um, but when you look at something like this, what do you think? If I need to take a derivative, what rules might I start by using? I mean, we can do that, but we do have rules for tangent and like finding the derivative of tan, right? The question we kind of need to ask ourselves is, is it going to be more helpful to leave it in the way that it is or yes? Is it going to be more helpful to leave it in the way that it is or to convert it? And in this case, I think if we made it into sine over cosine or sine uh, t over cosine t, it's going to be more complicated. Um, what I'm kind of going for here is you see a division bar. So we know that we're going to be using the quotient rule. So it's not necessarily like when you see the trig functions, you kind of get tripped up on like, how do I work with these trig functions? But break it down into what this really is. You have a function divided by a function. And we know that we can solve that because we have something of the form f of t divided by g of t. And I know that f of t is equal to sine t and split what? Oh, like split it into, into weight. No. I'm not sure what you mean by split it. Yeah. Um, if it were in the numerator, numerator, if it were like one plus sine, then we could have one over tan t and then sine over tan t. But because it's in the denominator, we can't actually split it like that. Um, so Honestly, the first place you start here is not with what those trig identities are. It is start with the quotient rule. We know we see this division bar. We know we can use the quotient rule here. Um, we thought about simplifying the tan into sine and cosine and then thought better of it. We said that might make it too complicated because then I'll have a quotient inside of a quotient, right? So instead, we're going to split it like this. Does it make sense why we just started doing it the way that we did? <clears throat> then we can find f prime of t, which is equal to the derivative of sine is going to be Cosine, and is that negative? No, exactly. And then we have g prime of t, which is going to be what? Yes, we would want to use the quotient rule here. Um, the important thing, um, exactly. 
um, secant squared of t. Um, the important thing, I think, with trig functions is that they seem very intimidating, but we just need to think of them as functions. Like, if I could think about this as x squared over 1 plus, I don't know, x cubed, like, we would know what to do with that. Um, so if we think about trig functions just as functions fundamentally, then it might make it a little bit easier to work with them. Um, so tell me what the quotient rule is. Yes, so um, we could break this down even further. We could say g of t is equal to 1 plus tan t. And then to take the derivative, which is d dt, we would then say that the derivative of g is equal to the derivative of 1 plus the derivative of tan t, right? Because derivatives are additive. So this would mean that our derivative is equal to the derivative of a constant is going to be what? Zero. Plus the derivative of tan t, which is going to be secant squared. So that's what happened to the one, is it just got zeroed out. Um, so feel free if it makes more sense to you, of course, to walk it through all the way out. Um, because keeping track of the steps that you take is going to be a way for you to go back and read through your work and make sure that you haven't made any mistakes. Um, and yes, that is what the quotient rule is. Um, so we said that the quotient rule looks like this. G times F prime minus F times G prime over G squared. So we get to put this together. Um, it's going to be G, so 1 plus tan T and F prime, the right color, which is cos t um, minus f, which is sine t, times g prime, which is secant squared t, all over g squared. So that's going to be 1 plus tan t squared. Okay, um, I would say that for this exam, you are going to want to like put like something that looks a little bit like this, split it up a little bit um, so that you're going to end up with something that says y prime um, is going to be equal to cos t. Um, actually, it's probably not going to do any good cancellations. Yeah, if it's not going to do any good cancellations, then you probably don't want to do it. Um, tan t. And I don't see any trig identities that will actually help here. So, yeah, you could probably just leave it in like this. And that is kind of how we would want to approach a problem like this. Um, let me find another one. Um, did we do number 16 last week? if we did. Um, well, uh, 
let's try number 16 then. Um, actually, I don't know. I want to like get, get some practice doing less common trig identity derivatives because I think that might be good practice for you, but not a huge amount of them are cropping up in here. So, we're just gonna make them up. Um, we're gonna say that this is y is equal to x cubed um, times cotangent x times um, cos squared x. This is a messy problem. This is going to be a very messy problem to solve. Does anyone have any idea where to start to find this derivative? So you're going to say that this is um, x cubed, and then you're going to say that this is 1 over, or rather 1 over tan, which is cos x over sine x times. Is that not it? I'll have to write it out. That is what cotangent is, right? Oh, beginning to doubt myself. I never cos the cos. So that wouldn't be one over sine cosine. that would end up being cos cubed over, yeah, that's what I got. Okay. Well, now we've rewritten it. What's my next step? Okay. Um, what rule are we going to be using? Product rule. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and split it up explicitly. So you want your f of x to be equal to x cubed, right? So that your f prime of x is equal to 3x squared. What do you want g of x to be? How are we going to find g prime of x? Quotient rule. So we got to split this up again. Here we have, I'm going to call this k. And so if cosine 3x is k, then k prime is equal to what? Uh, 
Um, is that it? I would say that we would need to Sorry, I haven't done this problem before. I just kind of pulled this out of, you know, slamming some trig functions together. Um, but if k is equal to cos cubed, if I write it like that, we've got a function to a power. So I'm thinking that we need to use the chain rule to say that this is, for instance, u. So k prime would be equal to three cos x squared, but it would be times, if we're using the chain rule, we cannot forget that it would be times the derivative of the internal function. Does that make sense? Would you like me to write it out explicitly again? Um, minus sine squared x minus cosine to the fourth x. Where are you getting that from? Oh, okay. Um, let's just wrap this up then. Um, put it all together and we're going to end up with, um, it is, sorry. I am the one who always forgets which one is minus which one, but it is G F prime minus F prime G. No, G F prime minus F G prime, right? So that would be k prime times j minus j prime times k. Double check me on that. I, I'm like 90% sure that's right. Divided by j prime. So we're looking here at three cos squared x minus sine x times sine x minus cos x times cos cubed x all over uh, that's j squared. So all over sine x. Um, yeah, so we're definitely going to, that three is going to be hanging around for a little bit. Um, we'll continue solving it out. We'll say that this is three cos squared x minus sine squared x. I missed a square here. Um, right? Three cos squared x sine squared x. Minus sine just squared. And I added a squared now instead of took it away. 
So I just distributed that sign. And my computer is dying. That's why. That's not correct. But the idea is, is that then we have minus cos to the fourth x all over sine squared x. Okay. So we can split this now, like you suggested earlier. We'll have three cos squared sine x over sine squared x. You can get rid of that square and that sine minus sine squared x over sine squared x minus cos squared x over sine squared x times that's just cos squared x twice. So I would turn this into something that looks like three and that's cos actually instead of canceling that out we could just turn it into a tangent squared and that would be fine. So that's what we're gonna do. Um, might be easier. Um, so this is going to be instead, this is a ta uh, cotangent there. So this is going to be three cotangent squared x sine x minus, and I'm going to go over here, that's again a cotangent, cotangent squared x cos squared x minus one. Is that pretty? No but we did it. We went through all of that work, all of that nonsense, and we got an answer. I'm gonna squish this out a little bit further. Um, and I'm gonna rewrite it. So actually we probably don't need to rewrite it, but I'm gonna do it anyway over here so that we have a little bit more room to do the product rule. squared x sine x minus cotangent squared x cos squared x minus one. Okay, so that was a lot of just algebra, putting stuff together, taking it apart, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. To end up with g prime, we needed to use both the quotient rule and the chain rule to find that. Now, what is the product rule? Yep, it's going to be F times G prime. So here we're gonna have X cubed times what we found for G prime, which turned out to be three cotangent squared x sine x minus cotangent squared x cos squared x minus one plus f prime, which we said is three x squared and g which we said we can turn that into cotangent x cos squared x just because I don't want to draw. That is what we're looking at here. And it is kind of your responsibility like on an exam to say that if the answer is you're looking at multiple choice and if the answers don't have any cotangents in them, to put it all in terms of cosine and sine, um, et cetera, et cetera. But that is the gist of what we're doing here. Um, I'm gonna put us on pause for just one second while I flip my charger out so my computer doesn't die. Give me just one second.
So thoughts, comments, and concerns on this? Is this kind of the struggles that you were having? Um, yeah, my number one piece of advice, well, I have two major pieces of advice. First of all, these are trig functions. You know what a function is, you know how to deal with x squared. Just try to think of it like any other function and treat it like any other function. Um, and then my second piece of advice is to write everything down. So write down what f and f prime of x are. Write down g and g prime, and then split it up into, if you need to find g prime using the quotient rule, then write down what the quotient rule is. And you're gonna, you know, it's gonna take up space and it's gonna be a little time consuming, but that way that you can really keep track of what's going on. And for instance, you won't miss that like chain rule question because you, you treat it a little bit too much like x cubed and you lose part of the answer. So, I actually, I see we screwed up somewhere. <laughs> Looking now, it's times a minus sine x, not minus sine x. This is a multiplication sign that didn't get pulled in. This is times, should be minus three times sine x. So, scratch all of that. Oh, darn it. Shoot. The principle is the same. We just made a mistake in the implementation of the algebra, which is disappointing. This becomes minus 3 cos squared x sine squared x minus cos to the fourth x. Right? If that's multiplied. And that becomes minus 3 cos squared x minus cotangent squared x cos squared x. So that's a little simpler, actually. That's a lot simpler. But just keep an eye out for stuff like that, because I'm, it's an easy mistake to make, and it's a hard mistake to catch. But when you write it all out, in, in this way, it'll be easier to find. Um, I would like to get to a couple practice problems with um, absolute values. So I'm going to go ahead and do some of that right now, unless you have any extra questions about trig. Um, we had a hard time with these last time. So let's try to do maybe a little bit of an easier one and then work through it. And maybe, maybe we'll be able to do like a little bit of a harder one. Uh, I don't remember these being like super prominent on the exam, um, but if there is one that crops up and we're like totally clueless, then it's going to be, it's going to be rough. So here we have the limit of x going to negative two. We have it set up in this way. What is the first thing you're going to want to try to do? Um, first thing I would try to do is just sub it in to see what happens. Um, and what we end up with is 0 over 0, which you don't know how to deal with. So um, 
Next, what are we going to think about doing with that absolute value? Yes. Okay. So what, what are the cases in which, okay, let's, let's kind of divvy it up like this. Um, it's either going to be X plus two. Um, when, what is the case? when we're approaching negative two from the left or from the right, or when X is, uh, this is kind of what I was thinking, when X is greater than negative two, right? Wait. Yeah. Let's break it up a little bit more like this. It's going to be x plus 2 when x plus 2 is greater than 0, which is when x is greater than negative 2. And then it's, we're going to have minus x plus 2 when x plus 2 is less than 0. Or when x is less than minus 2. Okay. So we're at this point. Sorry, I work through these very slowly because I also struggle. Um, we have it approaching from, yeah, exactly. When it's approaching from the left, when it's coming in from like minus three, when it's less than minus two, that means that our absolute value is going to equal either this or this. And so this is when it is from the left and this is when it is space on the table from the right. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so we've established like this is the conditions when it's when x is greater than minus two or when it's approaching minus two from the right. And this is the conditions when it is approaching minus two from the left. So now we know which two ways we need to deal with this. So we're going to split this up into, we have the limit of x going to negative 2 from the left of x squared or x plus 2 over x plus 2. Um, and then we have the limit as it's approaching from the right. Um, so let's just do the right first. We said that x plus 2 is going to be the equivalent of x plus 2 as long as x is greater than minus 2, right? The absolute value is going to just be x plus 2 as long as x is greater than minus 2, which is what we're saying is the case here. So we're just going to turn this into x plus 2 over x plus 2. We can say that these are quantities. What is the limit of uh, this function approaching minus two from the right? It's going to be one. Next, let's think about this from the left. <clears throat> We're going to turn this into Um, we said that this was going to be the equivalent of minus x plus 2, right? Because we're coming at it from the left, x is going to be coming at it from a place that is less than minus 2. 
um, and we're going to have it set up like that. So what is the limit as it approaches from the left? So what can we say about the limit as x approaches minus 2? doesn't exist. Exactly. Because the limit from the left does not equal the limit from the right. We have a plus one and a minus one, so they are not the same. Okay. It was a little bit of a simpler one. Let's try to do something that's a little bit grotier. This one looks pretty grody, so let's do it. Um, okay. So we have the limit um, of as x goes to 1 of x squared plus 2x minus 3 over x minus 1. I can see immediately that if I, or the absolute value of x minus 1, I can see immediately if I try to put 1 in, I'm going to get divided by 0. Um, and it's going to be 0 on top 2. It'll be 0 divided by 0. That's 1 plus 2 minus 3. So that's not good. Um, So, what is the first thing that you would do here? Yes. So we're going to establish that um, the absolute value of x minus 1 is either going to be equal to x minus 1 or minus x minus 1. When is it going to be equal to x minus 1 for what values of x or when? is greater than or less than zero. X is greater than or equal to zero. Perfect. Um, so this is when X is greater than or equal to one. Then this must be, if that is when greater X minus one, greater than or equal to zero, here it is less than zero, right? All other cases. So this is when x is less than 1. So we have established greater than or equal to from the right. Less than approaching 1 from the left. What is one other thing that we might want to think about doing before we start solving this problem? What's up with the numerator? Is there something that we could factor this into to make our lives a little bit easier? We could quadratic it. Um, I don't think we need to. Um, This is something that you get used to just by practicing. I know that I have an X, um, or use the, I use the quadratic formula, sorry, that's what I read that comment as, which I'm sure is not what you actually meant. Um, it is a quadratic function. We can just factor it as it were. Um, is it minus, it'll be minus one and then plus three. 
So I can double check this. I can say this is x squared minus x plus 3x minus 3. And that is equal to x squared plus 2x minus 3. So I have factored this. And it's really handy to see an x minus 1 there, right? x plus 3. So now, and this is over x minus 1, the absolute value. So now I get to split this again. Um, here is it from the left. We can rewrite it to say this is the limit as x approaches 1 of, we have our numerator, which is going to remain the same as we just factored it. And then our denominator is going to be minus x minus 1, because we said that this is coming in from the left. Um, so we can cancel out the x minus 1, and we end up with the limit of minus x, the negative x plus 3. And we have x approaching 1 from the left. So how are we going to find this final limit? We're going to plug in 1, so it'll be equal to. Minus 4. Perfect. OK. And then we do the same thing from the right, where we have the limit as x goes to 1 here from the right. We have our numerator, which is x minus 1 times x plus 3 over. Um, now, instead of minus x minus 1, it's just x minus 1. These are going to cancel, so we're going to end up with the limit the x approaching 1 from the right of x plus 3, which is going to equal 4. So what can we say about the limit of the whole thing? Doesn't exist. Again, because the limit from the left does not equal the limit from the right. Okay. How are we doing with this? I personally find these to be pretty rough. I have to take them pretty slow and I'm sorry that you have to also go as slow as I am going. Um, but it is gonna be really handy on the exam if one of these does crop up because it can be pretty overwhelming. Um, do we have any other questions, comments, or concerns? Um, well, that's pretty much all I've got. Um, if you guys would like to sign off now, then I'm okay with that. Um, if you guys would like to stick around and do some more trig problems, we could do that too. It's up to you. For sure. Thank you guys for coming. I really hope your exam goes very well. Um, good luck. I know you don't need it, but I'm sending it your way anyway. Um, I hope you have a great exam and a great end to your weekend. Thank you for coming. <laughs>